This is going to be the first of two lectures on foraging ecology in birds. As I mentioned, birds are endotherms and they have incredibly high metabolisms and so that means they really burn through the calories. That really is the primary goal of their foraging is to get the molecules that will provide those calories and that typically comes in the form of carbohydrates, fats, and sometimes proteins. Carbohydrates and fats are the most important of these for uh, short-term energy in the case of carbohydrates and more long-term storage and use of, of energy uh, in the form of fats. Protein can be broken down and used as a calorie source, but usually only at, kind of as a last resort. Now, what are the primary foods that birds eat? Well, they do eat seeds and fruits, uh, as shown here with these cedar wax wings, and we'll talk about some of the problems associated with being around frugivores, that fruit is digested very quickly and so if you're under a bunch of cedar wax wings or any kind of bird that's eating fruit you better not stay there long because uh, you're you're gonna get bombed but then a lot of birds eat other animals uh, as seen here with this bee eater which is eating a dragonfly there are some other things though that birds do need to incorporate in their diet so calcium is a big one and that's, this is particularly true of females as they're going into the breeding season they're going to need to sequester lots of calcium for uh, use in producing their hard-shelled eggs and the so typical sources of calcium include uh, mollusk shells, bones, even the previous eggshells that they produced and sometimes even, even uh, calcium based rocks like uh, caliche like rocks that you see in West Texas. Now what this figure here is showing is a group of, of parrots, in this case macaws, landing on this muddy cliff that has a high concentration of clay. And they're demonstrating what is called geophagy. They're actually eating this clay. And it turns out that there are two real reasons why they do this. Now, one, as shown here, is this soil has a high degree of sodium, and so it's a good source of sodium for them. But there's also some indication that these parrots oftentimes are eating fruits that have certain toxins associated with them and the clays in these soils can actually bind with some of these toxins and make some of their food uh, more digestible. All right, well let's talk about how birds actually uh, get their food. And we're gonna talk about some just general categories of, of feeding. A lot of birds are what we call gleaners. So gleaners, uh, like this yellow rumped warbler here, they hop around in vegetation and they're looking for prey like insects and spiders that are actually on the surface of uh, the bush or the tree and then they just glean they just they pick those off so they're not waiting for them to fly or anything they're literally just picking those off of the surface other birds like this chipping sparrow here are uh, gatherers so they're gathering seeds off the ground parrots are also basically gatherers but oftentimes going after fruits so gleaners and gatherers are really kind of the same thing but generally we talk about gatherers uh, more oftentimes going after plant-based material instead of, of insect uh, and, and other arthropod prey, which generally we refer to as gleaning. Many of the charadriforms are what we call probers, so sandpipers, plovers, uh, these are probing their bills into the sand. We talked about this previously when we talked about the importance of different bill shapes and sizes. This uh, provides uh, an ability for more species of charadriforms to coexist in a, the same environment because they're going after slightly different prey. And so remember we call this niche partitioning. So they're in the same foraging guild, but they can still reduce the competition with each other by going after different prey within that uh, foraging guild. And uh, by, by having these different bills that re reduces the competition. So that is they're partitioning this foraging niche. So it's called niche partitioning. But probers can also exist in other areas, so not just in soil. So nuthatches, uh, titmice, creepers, as shown here on the right, there's a brown creeper. I've been looking, we've been looking for these in the lab. Uh, we haven't seen them yet, but we will. Uh, Pecan Park is a good place for these. But, but they're probing um, underneath uh, bark and within crevices and trees, trying to uh, get uh, insects and insect larvae and, and spiders and spider uh, egg cases and things like that. And sometimes they'll actually use their bill, um, and sometimes even nuthatches are known to use sticks and, and uh, other pieces of bark 
to get leverage to kind of uh, open up some of the uh, scalier parts of the bark. But the probe you're probably most familiar with are the woodpeckers. And so they're actually using that very hard, rigid bill to drill holes uh, into trees, oftentimes into uh, dead parts of the trees, and then use their incredibly long tongues that we've already talked about to uh, probe in there looking for insect larvae typically. Another uh, type of foraging mode are flush pursuit predators. So in some ways this is kind of like gleaning. They're um, oftentimes moving along a tree trunk or a, a tree branch or in the case of a mockingbird oftentimes on the ground looking for prey but how they discover the prey is they frighten it to get it to fly off and then they, they uh, chase after it. And so they do this by extending these white patches. So sometimes if you look at a mockingbird on the ground it will slowly kind of open up its wings to expose these white patches and do the same thing with the tail to expose these white patches. And sure enough what you see is that that spreading and in, in the uh, showing of these patches um, does increase the movement of prey and prey attacks. And that's what's shown here. If you just look at the normal posture when something like, and this is data from a red start, when a red start is, is moving around a tree trunk, um, you don't see really any difference uh, between prey being flushed if they're not opening up their tail, if they've been experimentally uh, have had that white part of their tail darkened. So it really de doesn't make a difference. But sure enough, if you uh, open that tail, you may get a, a slight increase in prey flushing if you don't have the white patches, but look at how much more effective the white patch is when uh, you spread your tail uh, and expose that white patch. It, it, it sen seems to frighten the prey so that they uh, take off and then the red starts, or in some cases mockingbirds will go after the prey. Another foraging mode is a sit and wait ambush predator. This is typically what herons and egrets do and that's what we're seeing here. Um, behaviorally they do some interesting things. The bird on the left is a snowy egret and they have these black legs but they have these bright yellow feet and they actually move their feet in the water slowly to kind of give them some contrast so that if a, a fish swims over their feet they'll be able to see it more uh, plainly and probably the movement of those feet acts in some ways like the the flushing in the, the flush pursuit predators. But generally what they're doing is they're just standing in the water really still uh, waiting for prey to come close enough where they can attack them. The bird on the right here, what it's doing is it's, it's trying to reduce the glare on the water by shading uh, an area that it's looking into the water to, to see if it can uh, see the approach of fish uh, in its sit and wait stance. This is an eastern phoebe. We've seen a lot of eastern phoebes out in the field and they demonstrate what is called hawking or sally fly catching. So they tend to have some favorite perches that are oftentimes exposed and what they're doing is they're just waiting for something to fly by then they fly out really quickly and catch it uh, and then return to a perch to eat it. Oftentimes returning to the exact same perch. But don't confuse that with open aerial insectivores. So open air insectivores, what they're doing is they're just continuously flying, uh, going after flying prey and eating it on the wing. So this is typically the foraging strategy of swallows and swifts. Flamingos and some ducks are strainers, so they're going after microscopic invertebrate prey typically that is in the water or sometimes in the, the top parts of the soil in the benthic surface of a body of water and they're just bringing in water and some of that soil into their mouth or in some cases algae uh, and then squirting the water out and some of the non-digestible food but they're trapping in some of the microscopic invertebrate prey that then they can eat. Nectivores have some really interesting adaptations for going after nectar. So if you look at a hummingbird's tongue, it's not a closed tube like a straw. Instead, it has these two uh, laminate extensions that look almost kind of feather-like. You can see that here in this individual. But up close, what you see happening when it's actually inserted into nectar, you can see here, looking at the top figure, so here we have nectar. This is all nectar here, and we have air way out here. You can't really see the air here. But what's happening here is these, these two extensions of the tongue 
when they contact nectar, they start to curve inwardly. So the, the polar aspects of the fluid causes them to start to form these uh, straw-like structures. But they're really open before they go in there. And then you can see as it's being drawn out, so here we have the interface of air and the nectar. You see that what's happening is, is we're closing this up to, to end up producing this nice straw-like structure. And then they can um, bring that into their mouth. Hummingbirds oftentimes show like what we saw with the uh, shorebirds. They show niche partitioning by having different size bills that are co-adapted for different floral resources and this just allows more species in, in tropical areas to uh, go after very specific flowers. And this obviously benefits the birds in, as far as a, uh, an avian community in reducing competition, but it also helps the plants. So this is co-evolutionary beneficial for the plants because the plants are providing these floral resources because it encourages the birds to serve as pollinators. And if they can convince this bird to specialize just on their species or a limited number of species, there's a better chance that when they're picking up nectar from them, they're also picking up pollen, that they're going to visit a member of the same species and make that pollination successful. And so niche partitioning and, and specialization of floral resources is beneficial to both the birds and the plants. So what is it that the hummingbirds are going after uh, in this situation? Well they're going after sugars and hummingbirds can actually digest sucrose but most passerines can't do this and I, I bring this up specifically because that's this is what people do when they uh, make a hummingbird feeder. They just get a, a nice sugary water solution I'm um, usually like a three or four to one water to, to sugar. I like to make mine extra sweet. Uh, most people do a four to one ratio. But uh, sometimes, you know, people will find a, a bird like a sparrow or a warbler, something like that will hit their window and it'll be knocked out a little bit and they'll feel like, oh, well, we've got to take care of this bird and maybe if we just give it a little sugar, it, it'll, it'll perk it up. Um, those birds can't digest that sucrose. And so you're actually doing more harm than good for them. You're, you're kind of messing up their um, osmoregulatory functions. Well, a diet uh, of a, a nectivore is uh, largely based, again, on the sugars associated with the nectar. And during certain times of the year when they need more protein, they'll actually switch to an ins insectivorous diet. We've already talked a little bit about this. And the same thing with frugivores. They've also evolved just a more efficient use of protein so that they actually require less proteins in their diet. We talked about that previously with regard to frugivores. But certainly in the breeding season when they're feeding young, yes, they will give them nectar, but they'll also provide insects uh, and spiders and other arthropods to them. One extreme uh, diet specialization is seen in sap suckers. They create these sap wells, as you can see here on this tree, and they wait for those to fill up with sap and then they come and um, get the sugars associated with that sap. So they're taking advantage of the photosynthetic products that the, the tree is producing. Yes, there probably are also insects that are attracted to these sap wells as well, so they could be getting some uh, insects supplementing their diet with insects, but the primary thing that they're eating here really is the sap itself. Another extreme kind of case of diet specialization is seen in uh, honey guides in Africa. They are adapted for eating wax, and the source of wax they go after are honey beehives. Now, as far as anatomically, they're specialized to, to do this by having extra large gallbladders that produce lots of bile salts to help break down this wax, and uh, wax is a, a form of lipid, so there's a lot of energy associated with wax if you can digest it, but most organisms can't do it efficiently. But these honey guides can't usually get access to the honey beehives by themselves. And so they've evolved this mutualism with both humans and honey badgers. So when they find a honey bee hive, they'll fly until they find a honey badger or a human and they'll make a lot of noises to uh, get their attention and slowly lead them to the, the source of honey and wax and the honey badger is going to benefit from, from eating the larva and also getting some of the honey itself, um, but the honey guide is going to get the advantage of now having access to the waxes. So all birds show a basic continuum. I was just giving you some examples of some really diet specialists, so in, in the case of sapsuckers and the honey guides. 
But a lot of birds are on the opposite end of that spectrum, and they have a more generalist diet and generalist behaviors and generalist morphologies. I mean, look at the bill of something like an American crow or a common grackle. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly generalist bill. On the opposite end of the spectrum, though, you get some of the extreme specialists, like I mentioned, the hummingbirds that only go after uh, one species of flower or a reduced number of flowers. On the top here, we've got a hook-billed kite. Another example of an extreme specialist where its bill has evolved to be very efficient at uh, attacking just a few species of snails that are uh, living in trees and they um, can probe in and actually get at the, the nerve associated with uh, the mollusk, the snail, um, to paralyze it and then and pull it out effectively. Um, the bird next to that is an accipiter hawk. An accipiter hawk specialize on eating other birds. Uh, below that we've got a red cockaded woodpecker and we'll talk about red cockaded woodpeckers being more of a, not, not necessarily much of a, a foraging specialist, but a habitat specialist. And so that does in some regards limit their foraging capabilities. But then you have a lot of birds that are kind of just uh, somewhere in the middle of this continuum. So for example, a, a northern cardinal is primarily going to be going after seeds. It eats some insects as well. Um, but uh, it, its bill is definitely more specialized for producing that crushing power to, to get its seeds. Now where are you more likely to see specialists and a greater number of specialists? Well you tend to see that more in the tropics because there is a, a greater chance that you're going to be uh, having a stable food supply year-round so that the organisms can specialize um, on those resources. Sometimes the, a species within it there can be individuals that have very specific foraging modes. So there's a, a good example of that of the Cocos Finch in the Cocos Islands. Um, it's, this is one of the Darwinian finches, but it's not actually in the Galapagos. It's north of that. The Cocos Finch is, has very few competing species on this island. It was a kind of pioneer species landing on this island. And so it's, it's experienced what's called ecological release by having fewer uh, competing species. And individuals within the species are, have been shown to have very different specialized foraging modes. So some foraging um, in uh, trees on fruits, um, others uh, foraging on the ground, so there can be a, a great deal of specialization here. Not just location, but also what they're eating. What we really might be seeing here is just an early phase of sympatric speciation, so that this could actually lead to such a degree of specialization and niche partitioning that if like individuals only breed with other like individuals, then we could see the formation of multiple species. And so this could actually become an adaptive radiation. So we've already talked about the importance of bill shape in what you eat. So cross bills, we'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. The seed crushing bills of cardinals, the sifting bill of, of a American shoveler, this duck here meat ripping bill of an eagle, uh, spearing bill of, of something like uh, an egret or a heron, pelicans with their uh, pouched bill. So lots and lots of specialization. We even talked about the Ramphotheca and how it can have serrations associated with it for helping uh, something like a merganser go after its food. Crossbills, I want to say a little bit more about crossbills because there are different species of crossbills we're finding are becoming more and more specialized on very local conifer resources. And so their, their bills are being modified for going after generally green pine cones. And what they do is they open their bill just enough where they can stick it into these uh, slots in between these um, growing pines but they're still really tough to do. And so by closing and kind of turning your bill, you can open up these um, scales before they really um, become released with the mature seeds. And this allows these birds to get at these resources before other animals can. So we talked about the importance of bills, but tongues are also very important uh, for uh, being able to eat certain foods. So we've talked about kind of a generalist tongue like you've seen in A, but tongues can also have hook-like structures associated with them um, for dealing with things like fish. Um, the woodpecker tongue, I've already mentioned how it is very abrasive, it's kind of sandpaper-like and it has hooks associated with it, it's very long, for being able to probe into cavities and, and crevices and be able to get insect larvae. We talked about uh, how um, 
nectivorous uh, birds, their tongues work to form these tubes, but they're not completely tube-like all the time. And then the uh, tongue on the F is looking at a duck's tongue that is one of these uh, straining tongues. And we talked about the important uh, aspect of the hyoid muscles and how they contract to make the really long circus-like tongue of a woodpecker protrude. Again, just wanted to mention the foraging strategies of something like this snow egret um, by using its legs and feet of different color to help find their prey and, and maybe even get their prey to move uh, while they're doing their sit and wait foraging strategy. Other species have modifications of their legs to make them extremely long. So like the woodpecker tongue is long, um, some birds have incredibly long legs so that they can actually reach into crevices and, and grab prey. One of the things that one of my recent graduate students studied was uh, the, the potential that facial masks in birds like a shrike could produce some anti-glare capability so that if they're foraging in really sunny areas, kind of like a football player or a baseball player might put black underneath their eyes to reduce glare, um, do birds benefit from this? And sure enough, there is some indication that birds living in really open sunny habitats uh, do have these facial markings and they do provide some anti-glare benefits. That's her, what her re research was able to show. Now there are some other reasons why birds white might have these uh, black facial masks including uh, some birds that foraging uh, after fast flying insects or um, in some aquatic environments uh, going after fast moving prey. The, there, there's some indication that these black, especially the skinny black lines may help them to kind of line up their attack. So it's kind of like providing what we call sight lines uh, in their foraging and make, make them more efficient at going after their prey in the right direction. And then there's also some indication that females oftentimes will choose mates based upon the size and the darkness of black patches around the eye. So it could also serve as a sexual selected uh, form of trait. And sexual uh, dimorphism in some species can serve some of the same functions I talked about across species in reducing competition. So you can actually show niche partitioning within a species across different sexes. And so here we uh, have a hummingbird in which male and female have different sized bills because they go after different floral resources. Uh, and here's an extinct um, Hawaiian bird that uh, also showed some extreme dimorphism in bills that was likely associated also with subdividing the foraging resources. Hawks show extreme uh, sexual size dimorphism, uh, not much in the way of different bill shape, but, but they do uh, have different sizes. Females are typically much larger than males. This may have something to do with the uh, defense of the nest by females um, against uh, rival males, um, but there, there also is some indication that the size difference is also linked to different prey that they will go after, and so it, again, kind of reduces the competition among sexes. So finding food, um, we've, we've talked about the importance of vision in birds, but uh, olfaction, in general, we talked about not being really very good in a lot of birds. There are some major exceptions to that. So this is a petrel um, here on the left. These tube noses, generally what they're called in this group. And they do have really good olfaction. We talked about how they can use the smell associated with zooplankton swarms in the ocean to, to find those uh, floral res uh, sorry food resources and then go uh, consume that zooplankton. They also use this sense of smell to make it back to their nest as well. Vultures have really good sense of smell for um, smelling decaying flesh, and that's how they find their prey. Kiwis, as I mentioned, are probers, and they're going after uh, soil invertebrates, and they, in large part, are using their sense of smell. They have really poor eyesight. They're nocturnal species, and their nostrils are actually at the tips of their bill, and so olfaction is really important for them. As far as prey manipulation, especially um, as you're capturing insects, Rictal bristles are very important and they may also help to protect sensitive structures like the eyes uh, when you're uh, attacking some kind of invertebrate or, or even a larger prey. So that's what we can see here in, in flycatchers and uh, also there's a lot of sensitive bristles uh, in the bills of, of things like kiwis. Alright, that's the end of this lecture. We're going to continue talking about foraging strategies 
uh, in birds in the next lecture.